Seraphina and the Twisted Staff, Chapter 50 As Seraphina and Brayden walked together through the house to the Christmas party, Brayden took her down several corridors to the smoking room. It was richly appointed hideaway, with dark blue velvet chairs, fine blue wallpaper, and shelves of gold leaf leather-bound books, where the gentlemen would retreat after dinner to smoke their cigars and talk in private. The room was empty at the moment, but Serafina could tell that Brayden had paused for a reason. I wanted to show you something I think you'll find interesting, he said. He took her by the arm and led her into a room. One of the groundskeepers found something in the woods. He wasn't sure what to do with it, so he gave it to the taxidermist. As Serafina walked into the room, she looked around her. On the sculpted marble fireplace mantle sat a stuffed animal on a stand. There were only stuffed animals in the house, so it wasn't unusual. But it wasn't just a pheasant or a grossum. It was a barn owl with its sharp tongs clinging wishfully to a crocked stick and its wings splayed upward as if in sudden alarm. The owl seemed to have been particularly shocked. Look on its face. Ah, Serafina said, admiring the hour. owl. She wasn't sure if it was a male or a female, wasn't even sure how to tell the difference, but she decided it looked like her old friend and nemesis. She gave the owl a slow and seldom nod. Good evening, Rosa. Excuse me, I'm so sorry, Lady Renoa. Well, Braden said, my Aunt Editha asked you to make her feel at home. Serafina smiled and looked at the owl. Renoa, you will always have a home here at Beltmore. Serafina was pleased that she and Braden and their allies had defeated Renoa, but the truth was that in some ways her father had twisted Renoa's heart as melancholically as her staff had twisted the minds of these poor animals. Serafina couldn't help but wonder what would happen if Renoa had seen her past she needed to impress her father, had turned away from her father's vengeances, and had taken a different path. After studying the owl for a moment, Serafina asked Brayden, did the groundskeeper only find one? I'm afraid so, Brayden said, but I'll ask him to gather some of the other men and go back out and keep looking, both in the forest and along the shore of the river, just in case. Good, Serafina said. I would feel a lot better if we had two owls on the mantle rather than one, she said. Leaving the room, Serafina and Brayden walked over to the banquet hall. Before going in, Brayden paused at the door and looked at Serafina. Serafina gazed into the soft glow of the candlelit Christmas party in the opulent room. Glittering ladies with their long, formal gowns and handsome gentlemen in their black jackets mingled at the room, talking and laughing warmly, holding their champagne in a long crystal flutes. Along with the sparkling folks, most of the house servants were there as well, filled with a relaxing cheer and looking so different in their best day off clothes. The formalities of work put aside for this special evening. Many of the children of the servants were hovering by the Christmas tree waiting excitedly to open their presents. Serafina remembered being a little child curled up in a ball in the darkness of the bottom of the basement stairway, listening to the Christmas party above, longing to see and to share in the smiling faces of the other children. And here she was tonight for her first Christmas upstairs. As familiar as this was to her and as strange and foreign as well, 
This was the society she lived in. This was her home. There were her people, her kin, both distant and close. Standing with Brayden in the doorway, Serafina could see their reflection in one of the mirrors on the wall. It was memorized, memorizing to see themselves there. Brayden wore the black jacket, white tie, and white gloves that were customary of the young gentlemen of his station. His scrapes and bruises had been attended to, and his hair had been neatly combed. His face lit up with happiness, and his brown eyes sparkled with the reflection of the room's light. Serafina wore the beautiful golden cream satin gown that Brayden had given her for Christmas. With its magnificently embroidered pearl and braid, tr braid trim corset and its long castating train. As was customary of a young lady who wore matching satin opera gloves and glistening shoes adorn her feet. But unlike the other girls in the room who were wore their hair up and arranged, curled into tightly wound corifers, she had decided to let her silky jet black hair lie down and smooth over her shoulders, and her eyes were as yellow as a panther's. A few nights before, Brayden had invited her to join the dinner party, and she had said that she wasn't quite ready, but now he posed the question to her again. Ready to go in, he asked softly. I am, she said, and then they stepped in the room together. Chapter 51 Serafina had spent all the Christmases of her life in the darkness of the basement. When she stepped into the grand room, it glowed with the soft lights of hundreds of candles bathing everyone's faces and their smiles in a golden hue the women's silver threaded dresses seemed to silhouette in the light of the christmas trees everything in the room had been decorated with holly and mistletoe and poinsettias stockings hung on the mantle of the crackling fire fireplace a score of foresters had used a wagon and a team of Belgian draft horses to pull a massive 35-foot phaser fern tree up to Biltmore front door. Then the crew of men, included her paw, had worked together with ropes, pulleys, and poles to erect the giant tree in the banquet hall. There it had been decorated over days on end by servants and guests alike who stood on ladders adoring it with velvet ribbon, sparkling obers, and splendorous ornaments until it glowed filled with the entire room. Now beneath the tree lay a heap of Christmas presents for the children of the estate workers. Dolls and balls, horns and chimneys, trains and bicycles, harps and drums, wagons and pocket knives, and other toys of all kinds. Serafina and Brayden made their way over to the Christmas tree and stood beside it. They watched with a smiling as Mr. Vanderbilt called for anyone's attention and quieted the room. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Merry Christmas to you all. Merry Christmas, everyone shouted in return. As you all know, Mr. Vanderbilt continued, Here out bit more. We pride ourselves on staying up to date with the latest advertisements in science and technology. And tonight, on Christmas 1899, I would like to introduce you what may be, in fact, be the coming new century's most important invention. With a mischievous look in his eyes, he waved in a dozen smiling maids, including Essie, carrying baskets full of candy canes, which they had handed out to all the children and adults in attendance. But they weren't just normal all-white candy canes like they had seen before. They were striped with magnificent red spiral 
that brought loud cheer and laughter of delight for everyone in the room. As the night slipped on, the servants laid out all sorts of food, ham and roasted turkey, dressing and cranberries, and much more, all the bounty for the estate. For dessert, they had a plum pudding and fancy cakes, ice cream from the estate diaries, and apple turnips on the estate's orchards. And Mr. Vanderbilt pursued Mr. Olmstead to collect the children around the fireplace and read them a poem that began, "'Twas the night before Christmas." Seraphina and Braden gathered with the other children and listened to the poem with rapt attention. She loved the part that said, "'When all through the house not a creature was stirring, not even a mouse, she felt that way many times as she prowled through Biltmore at night. And she loved the line, the moon on the beast of the new fallen snow. The author of the poem had finally found a way to use daytime words to capture nighttime beauty. Halfway through the story, she looked over and saw her pa gazing at her. She remembered how he had found her in the forest when she was little and he never wanted in his life was to have a family for her to be his daughter, and tonight he was filling with a happiness and the relief she had never seen him with before. She rose up and walked over to him. At least there wasn't any salad tonight, Pa said, and none of them folks to learn, lean on. Thank goodness, he said winking at her and took her in her, his arms. A few moments later, she overheard Mr. Vanderbilt, Mr. Olstead, and the chief forester, Mr. Chinook, gathering around the fireplace, talking about the Biltmore School of Forestry that they'd set up. Her pa told her that it would be the first school like it in America to share the knowledge of rebuilding and managing forests. From what she could tell, it sounded like the men of Biltmore were hatching grand plans for the future. Thank you very much, Bedrick, Mr. Vanderbilt said, warmly to Mr. Olsted. What a delightful Christmas present it was to go out to Squanter's Clearing with you this morning and see all the work you've been doing. I must say, you're very good at keeping a secret. I had no idea that you and the crews had so much good progress. You've planted an entire clearing. It's marvelous. You're welcome, George, Mr. Olsett said, smiling broadly beneath his gray beard. The sight she'd seen in Olsett's eyes days before, before, was the surprise Christmas present, present that he had been planning for his old friend. And seeing his smiling face, she realized now the seriousness she suspended in Mr. Olson since the arrival wasn't some nefarious plan, but an elderly man's awareness that he only had so much more time on this earth to finish his work. He was determined to make good on his promise to Mr. Vanderbilt to build him a property in a forest that people would cherish for generations to come. The expression he saw in the wrinkles around his eyes and his mouth was the realization that he had probably come to his favorite place on earth for the last time in his life. That was, that would be his last Christmas at Biltmore, and one of his last years in the world he so dearly loved. As Serafina stepped away from the men by the fireplace, Mrs. Vanderbilt came over to her, and with a smile she handed her a small wrapped present with a red bow. You forgot to open yours, Serafina, Mr. Vanderbilt, Mrs. Vanderbilt said gently. For me, Serafina said in surprise. She towed away the wrapping paper and lifted the lid of a small wooden box. 
Inside, she found a finely painted miniature of a beautiful spotted jaguar. It was one of the Biltmore's very own cats. Thank you, Mrs. Vanderbilt, she said, looking up at her as she wiped a tear from the corner of her eye. I'd be very careful with it. It's just my way of saying thank you for everything you've done, Mrs. Vanderbilt said. Hoping she wasn't being too forward, Serafina asked, How have you been feeling, Mrs. Vanderbilt? You needed worried about me, Mrs. Vanderbilt said, touching her gently on the shoulders. I'm going to be all right. But even as she said the words, Serafina sensed, that there was something that Mrs. Vanderbilt wasn't saying. At the end of the evening, Serafina stood with Brayden by the Christmas tree. She had the feeling that everything was good and right between them. Merry Christmas, Brayden, Serafina said. Merry Christmas to you as well, Serafina. Brayden said, I'm glad we're finally home. A few seconds, her curiosity got the best of her and she asked him the question that was on her mind. You know what you did for Gideon and Kess? She began. Has it always been that way? I've loved animals all my life, he said, but I don't know. When I was a little, I found a metal lark with a broken leg. I fed it, and it took care of it, but a few days later, it legs healed and the birds flew off. I just thought it was how it was supposed to work. But when I helped the falcon and then Gideon, I began to realize that maybe I was different. Kess wings should not have healed. But it did, Serafina said, looking at him. I need to ask you something else, Brayden. Do you think it might work on people? I'm not sure, he said. She paused and then finally asked the real question she wanted to ask. Do you think you could help your Aunt Editha? I didn't think that's something I could heal, he said. I understand, Serafina said, grumbling, lowering, lowering her head. But then Brayden smiled. My uncle just told me that my aunt isn't ill. She's with children. She's with child. Serafina looked at him in surprise. A wave of shock and relief passed through Serafina. Mrs. Vanderbilt was going to be all right. More than all right. She was going to have a baby. That was such a tremendous news. But even as Serafina smiled, she could see that Brayden was thinking about her earlier question, about everything that had happened with Renoa and Gideon and the Falcon. Honestly, Brayden said, I don't truly understand what power I have. Serafina smiled. None of us do. Serafina lie on the front balcony of Lewis' 15th room of Biltmore House, swishing her tail and looking out across the open grass of the Esplanade and the moon arose casting its silver light over the tops of the distant trees. No one could see her there, for she was as black as the night itself. The daytime folk were in the house behind her, sleeping soundly in their beds. Serafina could see the silhouette of the wolves passing through the moonlight on the distant hill. They were returning, and in the spring the songbirds would come just as they had for a million years. The dark spell of the forest had been broken. The twisted staff were gone. A beautiful green luna moth fluttered by with a long tail st streaming behind. She watched as it fell up past the balcony, then headed for the gardens. It was late in the year for luna moth. But the animals were coming home. In the room behind her, Mrs. Vanderbilt and the baby within her still lying asleep, Serafina could sense her calm and steady heartbeats. 
She did not know why her mistress had decided to sleep this evening in the room that planned on turning into the nursery. It was if she and her baby were eager for their meeting day to come. Serafina gazed out across the land of the Epislide to the hilltops, looking for unusual shapes in the mist or a silhouette among the tw- trees or the silent passing of an abbey. She watched and she listened. She was the black centennial in the night. She did not know when or in what form, but she knew that one day more demons would come. She vowed to be watchful. She vowed to be ready. For the night was her domain and hers alone. Just a few days before, she had thought that she had decided between one path or the other, between the forest and the house, between the mountains and the gardens. But now she knew she did not have to decide whether she was a creature of night or the day, whether she was a catamount or human, wild or tame. She was all these things. She could be whatever she wished to be. Like the falcon that flies both night and day, she would do whatever she wishes to do. The T, the CRC, and the guardian, the human and the panther. She was all these things and more. But just as she felt a dark and lovely peacefulness finally beginning to flow into her soul, she saw a black cloaked figure moving through the trees in the distance. She couldn't make out an identity of the figure, couldn't even be sure it was entirely human, but whatever it was, it stopped and turned and looked at her with glowing eyes. Seraphina's heart pounded in her powerful chest as she stared back at the figure. She could feel her muscles beginning to bunch beneath her and her lungs filling with air. As she rose to her four feet, she glanced behind her to make sure Mrs. Vanderbilt was still safe in the bedroom. But when Serafina turned her back to look at the figure in the distance once more, the figure was gone. I hope you enjoyed the read aloud of Serafina and the Twisted Staff. I hope you have a wonderful day.